Good morning. I'm Adrian Arsht, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center and the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilient Center. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation on U.S.-Mexico priorities in the face of today's global challenges. It is my pleasure to welcome my friends and also, and my friends and the stewards of the U.S.-Mexico relationship. U.S. Ambassador Ken Salazar and Mexican Ambassador Esteban Montezuma. Bienvenido. I have had the pleasure of knowing Ambassador Salazar for many years and have seen firsthand how he is able to move ideas and translate them to action. That is just in the first few months of his time in Mexico. And we are lucky to have Ambassador Montezuma as Mexico's representative here in Washington. Since arriving a year ago, he is credited with showing the importance of the relationship between our countries. With you both here today, it reaffirms the strong U.S.-Mexico partnership, which is so important given the current state of affairs in the world, from COVID to Ukraine and beyond. As President Biden mentioned during the first State of the Union address, Mexico's role in the United States, Mexico is the largest trading partner with over $661 billion total trade in 2021. That makes security, migration, and efficient border practices a priority for both nations. Ambassadors, we look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas today for what additional opportunities may be ahead for the vital relationship between our two countries. And now I will turn this over to Jason Marzak, Senior Director of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center, who will moderate the conversation with Ambassador Salazar and Ambassador Montezuma. Jason. Thank you so much, Adrian, and Ambassador Montezuma, Ambassador Salazar, welcome back to the Atlantic Council, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, Ambassador Montezuma, as we're in the correct uh, color tie today. So uh, I also want to give a really warm welcome to our virtual audience, as well as our in-person studio audience, uh, including Congressman uh, Tony Gonzalez from, from Texas. Uh, great to have you here, Congressman. Uh, Ambassador Salazar, Ambassador Montezuma, um, we were in the same studio, it feels like deja vu, uh, just four months ago, uh, just after the North American Leaders Summit concluded. We had a really robust conversation about the opportunities that that presents for the U.S. and Mexico. And at that time, we, you both outlined a, a really important vision for the future of U.S.-Mexico ties. So I'd like to pick off today on, on what, where we stand and, and how we're going to continue to move forward. We'll look, first of, importantly, at the dire global context and Ambassador Salazar, you're appropriately wearing the Ukraine and, and U.S. flag as well today. Uh, and then we'll talk about progress since the North American Leaders Summit and priority areas uh, as part of the uh, overall relationship. But just because it's um, front and center for global attention, I'd like to first just start off with, 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 uh, with Ukraine, uh, R Russia's unprovoked attack uh, on Ukraine, and all eyes are, of course, uh, on Europe right now. And before we dive into specific areas that are vital to the U.S.-Mexico relationship, I'd like to ask you both how you see events in Europe and the global ramifications, as well as the potential implications or the ramifications of what events in Europe mean in the global context could mean for the continued renewed importance of the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Um, Ambassador Montezuma, I'll, st I'll start with you. Thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. And um, let me tell you something. Uh, Mexico has been uh, very sound, very clear, very 
is strong in its um, uh, condemned of the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we are part now of the Security Council of the United Nations and there uh, Mexico had a very clear position and we also pushed to have uh, a general assembly in the UN also in order to condemn this invasion and uh, that is the position of Mexico uh, which has been very clear and very vocal about it. Salazar, you were, you were uh, mentioned before that you were at in the Capitol yesterday when President Zelensky spoke. How do, how do you see the events in, 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 in Europe, Ukraine specific? How do you see that unfolding insofar as the impact and, and the imp importance for the U.S.-Mexico relationship? Thank you uh, very much, Jason, and uh, thank you to Adrian Arsht and uh, to the Atlantic Council for hosting us. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here with my friend uh, Esteban Montezuma. There are many, many things. So we're working on together, and obviously we'll be discussing those in a few minutes. On uh, Ukraine, you know, it's like, the, like President Biden has stated many times in his leadership of unifying the world in support of the U Ukrainian people. You know, it breaks your heart. Uh, anyone who watched uh, President Zelensky's speech and uh, the video that was uh, part of that speech knows that there is such great human suffering that's going on, and uh, a one person, one dictator can do what is being done there is uh, something which is reprehensible. And so the unity of the world, the Western world, is really important. And I think what it has done in many ways, unified the world and, and, and most of the world against, uh, against uh, Russia. And we've been pleased that Mexico has been uh, supportive of the UN uh, decisions and other decisions that have, have been made. For me, I think long range, what it underscores is uh, the importance of this alignment uh, between Mexico and the United States. So much of the world's economic security and uh, national security is based on the relationship between these, these two nations. And so as we've gone through this chapter of the Russian invasion, for me, what it has underscored is the relationship that the U.S. and Mexico have had for a long time, including the very exemplary relationship that they had during World War II. Yeah. So, you know, it lots, it, Heart, heart is broken, but the unity of the world uh, ultimately will pre prevail, and the relationship between uh, U.S. and Mexico is key to that. As you say, Ambassador, the relationship with the U.S. and Mexico and the broader Western Hemisphere that's been so so uh, important in this. I want to move on to topics specific to the U.S.-Mexico relationship, migration, energy, security, uh, commerce, a, a lot to talk about. Uh, we're also today, I guess, celebrating uh, Ambassador Montezuma. You've now been here in Washington about a year. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Salazar, you, it's been about six months uh, since you first uh, arrived in, in Mexico. So this is also a, a celebration looking at what, what type of advances we have on those and the different key issues. But let's start with migration. Uh, Ambassador, uh, Homeland Secretary uh, Ali Mayorkas was in Mexico earlier this week and then he went on to, to, uh, to Costa Rica. Um, and uh, this week, of course, to address migration, Ambassador Salazar, you've been very focused on that since you're uh, arrival in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, there are um, plans, there's discussion about the potential uh, uh, revoking of Title 42, uh, some questions of whether the CDC will continue to con uh, continue with uh, uh, moving forward Title 42, uh, which as reported could lead to an increased numbers uh, at the southwest uh, land border, uh, some maybe potentially similar to some of the numbers we saw in July and, and August of, of last year. What are the next steps, I'll start with you, Ambassador Salad, what are the next steps that you're thinking of planning uh, to advance U.S.-Mexico cooperation on migration, especially amid this potential of a real increase in, uh, in border encounters at the southwest border? So, uh, Jason, it is a, a very significant issue for the United States as well as for Mexico and many other countries. So, Secretary Blinken, uh, President Biden from the beginning, uh, including the conversations that we had during the Knowles meeting here in November, have the view that we need to deal with uh, this challenge and this opportunity on a regional basis. And so we are doing that, and there's lots of aspects to it. Secretary Mayorkas was there. Uh, President Man Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador has uh, frequently welcomed members of the Biden administration into his office. I think now there have been some seven members of the cabinet who have spent a significant amount of time with him. We recognize that we're living in a, in a world of migration that we had not seen uh, in our history and caused by a lot of different factors. You know, one, the pandemic, uh, two, the great poverty that exists in certain areas of the world, 
the instability in governments that simply are falling apart, Venezuela, Nicaragua, others. And so the only way we're going to deal with these issues, including it when Title 42 goes away, which is, by the way, a, a health care uh, determination, when all that happens, it's going to be important that we're all in this together. Uh, hence, the, I underscore the importance of the North American Leaders Meeting here in Washington, where the two presidents and uh, Minister Trudeau spent the whole of a day talking about the importance of working regionally. And so Secretary Blinken and his team, including uh, my great friend uh, Brian Nichols, have been working very hard on putting together this uh, regional approach to how we deal with the challenge of migration. And, and how do you see that regional approach unfolding in the next few months uh, and the preparations for the, this potential of the CDC, as you mentioned, it being uh, Title 42 being a health measure, been in place for about two years now. And so if Title 42 no longer exists, how do you see those preparations moving so as to best uh, um, uh, diminish the number of uh, unauthorized crossings into the, into the U.S.? So there's the, the formula for us relatively simple. It has to be, I mean, it's not simple, it's very complex, but the concepts are not all that difficult. One is we need to have the agreements in place with uh, the land bridge comp company countries from Colombia up north. Those are happening, uh, and so we have cooperation now, Costa Rica, Panama, other countries where you essentially have the flow of migrants coming north. Secondly, we need to do more within uh, the migrant corridor to create more humane treatment of migrants who are coming across. And third, we need to create opportunities for people who are leaving their places. Secretary Blinken calls it, uh, you know, people should have the right to remain. Yeah. And so we're surging in what we're trying to do with root causes, what uh, Mexico is trying to do with Sembrando Vida and Jóvenes Construyendo del, Fu del Futuro. Those are things that are, are happening already, but they're going to happen, in my view, even in a, in a more expedited way. And Vice President Harris has also talked about migration being a, a, a choice a, a, and rather than a, a necessity that many are faced with. Ambassador Montezuma, um, love to get your perspectives on uh, Mexico's role and how President Lopez Obrador is, uh, what, how he is seeing this opportunity for renewed cooperation, uh, strengthened cooperation with the U.S. on, on migration. And, and then also, uh, how would a renewed plan, regional plan for migration, how does that also fit into the President's vision for southern Mexico and Central America, which is so important to your president. Yes, uh, Jason, I, just as uh, my friend Ken uh, Salazar just said, uh, there are different uh, tracks where we have to tackle uh, migration problems. And first of all, Mexico has been uh, very, very active, very helpful in order to uh, help uh, to uh, control the flow of migrants from uh, the south. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, we, we have a regional problem, which is not just a national problem. Uh, before, migration was just an issue of Mexico and the USA. Then it became an issue of several of the uh, uh, northern central uh, nations from Central America and Mexico. And, and now we have flows uh, from different parts of the world which are increasing. So the challenge has been uh, uh, raising, and, uh, but also the collaboration and also the dialogue and the measures to really uh, uh, tackle this issue. So uh, these tracks that uh, we're working at are first, of course, uh, what is the flow of migrants? Uh, second, uh, as Ken just said, uh, it's to address the roots of migration, a, a development approach to migration. And third, which is very important and we keep pushing on it, uh, which is uh, to widen the legal path to migration. Because uh, if you have a, a flow that is constantly pushing and you have a, 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 a legal path, then you have another a, a means to, to really a, help a, this flow to decrease. Uh, just to give an example, temporary workers, uh, are a, it's a figure that uh, really, really works. Uh, there are in, in the United States about 235,000 uh, Mexicans with that uh, visa, which is the uh, 2HA and 2HB. And they come and work in the United States and go back to Mexico. And they're so vital for the U.S. economy, too. And it's very vital to the U.S. economy 
the U.S. needs labor, and it's vital to them to have an income, and they come here to do what they want. They don't want to live in the, in the mm -hmm. States. They want to work in the States and then go back with the families. So that's another path that we are exploring. Fantastic. I, I want to move on to uh, energy. Uh, a lot of um, all eyes are right now, uh, Ambassador Montezuma, on Mexico's proposed uh, energy reform, which is uh, currently uh, being uh, debated in the, in, the, in the Mexican Congress. Uh, there a number of different measures. Uh, we have an infographic from the Atlantic Council that came out recently that looked at some of the uh, changes that would happen as part of that uh, energy reform, among other things, giving the state-owned uh, uh, electricity company, CFE, 54% uh, of Mexico's power market and changing a, a variety of other uh, terms with regard to private energy companies. Uh, Ambassador Martel, I'll, I'll start with you. I'd like to hear first your um, message to foreign investors uh, in Mexico who may worry about the cost uh, of electricity production uh, as part of this uh, re reform and have questions about kind of their future investments in Mexico if this reform were to, were to move forward? Well, uh, what we have uh, right now in Mexico, it's uh, called the Open Parliament, which means that the initiative has been discussed uh, by uh, all the uh, sectors, uh, companies, and people interested in, in that uh, within the, the uh, representatives and the Senate House. So uh, what uh, we're going to have it's uh, the resolution of the Congress. Uh, Mexico has a, a very strong division of power. And uh, uh, what uh, we are expecting is uh, what's going to be the outcome of this initiative. Um, many, many companies have been very vocal and active uh, telling uh, what they think about the, the initiative. Um, in Mexico, we need a strong um, a public uh, electricity enterprise because it's responsible of, of all the grid. All the grid is, is, is uh, supported by CFE. And um, there is uh, private participation, almost half of it, 46%. And so uh, whatever comes from the initiative, I think that uh, it's going to be uh, for the better and, and the efficiency of uh, the system as a whole. And uh, one thing that also uh, is the backbone of President López Obrador's uh, uh, view about not just electricity, but any public uh, uh, activity is to, to really uh, get rid of uh, corruption. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's part of the initiative to really make a transparent uh, system. You said getting rid of corruption has been one of, one of President López Obrador's priorities from the day he took office, isn't yes, it? Indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, for uh, Ambassador Salazar, you, uh, this, you were just visiting the Penitas plant in, in Chiapas uh, recently with, uh, with President Lopez Obrador and, and Secretary Nahali uh, uh, just, just recently. And I you know that there's also been, you've been, I assume, hearing concerns as well from U.S. companies, U.S. investors about the energy reform and, and, uh, and its, its implications. Um, what, what do you see as, as your role as ambassador? Uh, U.S. ambassador in Mexico insofar as navigating some of the complexities around uh, this proposed energy reform? So my role as ambassador is to represent the United States and to carry out President Biden's wishes. And uh, the way we view the energy electricity reform challenges is we have to resolve it in a way that it supports the vision of the United States of America, and that's to create a clean energy powerhouse. And uh, that's part of the series of conversations we've had. President Lopez Obrador has been very open in meeting with Secretary Kerry, Secretary Granholm, myself. We have all expressed our real concerns. Uh, I, you know, in, in the State Department world, they call these things inquietudes. Uh, I call them temblores, or little <laughs> earthquakes. But we still have the, the, the building together. And so we need to work through uh, some really tough issues. One of them has to do with contracts and permits and we're pushing resolution of those things. Hopefully there will be some resolution of that because otherwise you can't have confidence in investment in Mexico. And then secondly, monitoring what's happening this re with this reform. You know, Mexico has its own sovereignty. Uh, they will pass something, legislation of, of some kind. 
But at the end of the day, our concern is that it support the integration of the supply chain between the United States and Mexico. Everywhere I go, I've been to some 20 states now in Mexico, I see how our economies are so already integrated. Yeah. I was at the GM plant in Salau. The electric mobility is coming there. They're standing up a line of electric cars for the Silverado uh, and other vehicles that they uh, produce there. And you can't have um, a system that doesn't support that clean energy future because it'll have such disruption for the supply chain. Maybe. Ambassador Bethesda, maybe I'll turn it back to you. Do you uh, what do you see insofar as the potential of uh, this reform moving through the Mexican Congress in a way that uh, could be modified to assuage some of the concerns that have been raised, and the Ambassador Sellers are mentioned that he's heard from some U.S. Uh, companies. Well, uh, we have a permanent um, dialogue with uh, specific companies to see their needs and what uh, is their reaction to this initiative. And um, uh, I believe that the outcome would be something that will guarantee uh, what the president needs uh, to strengthen the CFE and also uh, an open, transparent and efficient uh, market. So uh, I, I, I believe that's uh, the case. And there is one thing uh, in their opening uh, words, uh, Adrian uh, uh, said about our uh, need to be uh, a real close, uh, not neighbors, but also a region, including Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, one of the big pictures that we have to really uh, start drawing is um, how can we align domestic policies in order to have uh, a viewer impact in the region? We have already two calls in, in the world about uh, the need to create a really strong North American region. One was COVID and now is the war. Yeah. So uh, I think that uh, as soon as we uh, get really uh, aligned in order to create this important North American region, and we align domestic policies in the USA, in Mexico, and in Canada, uh, we will achieve uh, that, uh, which uh, will create the most important region in the world. You know, and I think Ambassador Montes, having you and Ambassador Salazar again here together, sitting together in, the, in this studio, shows the importance and shows the strength and the depth and how deep that North American partnership really is. And that by working together, it's amazing what we can achieve, not just in North America, but frankly, in, in the world. Um, I want to get to other topics. Uh, as, if I may, go ahead. Jason, yeah. just on that one, because I think, you know, what Stevan just said about the integration of our economies and uh, creating a set of durable frameworks uh, for the future domestic policies on both sides. Anybody, anyone could say those things. Uh, most people, would, a lot of people would say it's not happening. It is happening. Uh, you had two presidents meeting at the White House mm -hmm. talking about their vision. We are working through some difficult issues. At the end of the day, we're not going to address the issue of migration by ourselves or Mexico by itself. We've got to do it together. Yeah. You know, somebody says to me a long time ago, six, it seems like six years, but it's only been six months when I was starting this job, and they <laughs> said, the most important thing you can do is to cry, try to create durable frameworks between the U.S. and Mexico. But look at the USMCA. The USMCA is a bedrock document that will guide the trade and the economic relationship into the future. Supported, yes, by Mexico, supported by us. Yeah, there's enforcement triggers that can be played. But at the end of the day, it's to support the, the integration. And to Esteban's point, we have to do that in other areas. We have to do it in migration. And that's what we're talking about with uh, the two presidents. And we have to do it in other areas that are important to the life of the two nations. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, on that point, supply chains. I mean, the, the, the importance of the North American supply chain has only grown in, in, in significance uh, mm -hmm. since the USMCA was, was ratified with, with COVID, with concerns about over-dependence on uh, trade with China, and with a real push uh, here in Washington uh, from a bipartisan push for nearshoring. And how do we bring supply chains closer uh, to the United States uh, maybe picking up on that point, um, Ambassador Montezuma, as we look at strengthening the supply chain, strengthening trade and commerce with, with Mexico, uh, what do you see, and, and we, as we look at nearshoring and the potential of nearshoring, what do you see insofar as opportunities to further deepen the commercial ties that have been set as part of the USMCA? What, what's still on the horizon of what you think USMCA 
can achieve and has um, it has yet to achieve, but 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 especially with this new push for nearshoring and bringing supply chains closer to home, could be possible between the U.S. and Mexico. As you know, the, we had the high-level economic dialogue, which um, uh, it's our framework in order to see uh, what's uh, the future of our economies and uh, the future of uh, some other issues uh, like migration, health, and so on. And uh, what we see is that um, the next step is to start aligning domestic policies. Because in the USA, there is concern about the Mexican uh, energy approach. In Mexico, there is concern about the automobile uh, approach to several issues that uh, uh, hindrance the production of uh, uh, automobiles in Mexico. So uh, this, uh, the importance of this dialogue is that in many things we might or not uh, agree but we are always uh, searching for the best for the two countries. And uh, as we get, uh, start aligning our domestic policies in order to help to integrate a wide vision, uh, which is uh, uh, the vision of the forest and yeah. start talking and stop talking about only trees, then we can uh, be working on what is best for the, for the region, which is to be integrated. Now, Ambassador uh, Salazar, one of the outputs of the North American Leader Summit, the last time we were all here together in this studio just a few months ago, was the commitment to create a trilateral supply chain coordination mechanism. It was a mechanism that would make uh, supply chains more resilient, more secure, and also sustainable, partly a reaction to what we saw during COVID with uh, um, challenges insofar as what was essential industries and, and, and what wasn't. What, what updates can you share on the creation of a mechanism such as that, or, or overall, on how you're seeing the opportunity to make the U.S.-Mexico trade more resilient and more secure in the future, as we will likely face other shocks to the system as we, as we have with COVID? You know, as I uh, speak to U.S. companies that are very interested in medical devices and uh, pharmaceuticals, they understand the importance of integrating the supply chains. When I speak to the presidents, they talk about how it's important for us to take the lessons learned from the pandemic. And one of those is to create security in the whole area of healthcare, which deals also you know, research and development and how we deal more effectively with the next pandemic if one comes our way. But in all that, you start getting down to medical devices, the manufacturing of them, the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, and so there's a lot in each one of those lines that are part of the supply chain. There's a whole effort uh, that has to be undertaken, and we're working on it. Uh, you know, there had not been, and I got to remind the world about this, until President Biden came to office, there had not been for five years an economic yeah. dialogue. I was with uh, Under Secretary Jose Fernandez in uh, Mexico City, and he was telling me about how the high lead, the H lead, was actually created way back in the Obama administration. He comes. He started the, the CEO dialogue or helped uh, the Mexican business and U.S. business start the CEO dialogue. It, was, it died for five years. Yeah. Okay, it's back. And so yeah. on May the 2nd and 3rd, there will be a big CEO dialogue here in the United States. So part of what's happened, there's a lot of work to do. I, I don't at all, I mean, the enormity of the challenge is so huge, Jason. But now there's good conversation and good relationship. And we're trying to solve problems and looking for opportunities on all supply chain aspects. Yeah, yeah, and I think as, we, as we've been discussing throughout this conversation, it's about working together to do that, right? And, and yes, there's a number of challenges, but the opportunities I think are even bigger, as especially as we look at the, at the current global context. Um, there's a, if you have a, for those watching online, if uh, you can feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function. I do have one about uh, attack on journalists in, in Mexico. Uh, I'd like to ask that as well, move to, move to security, uh, but, um, uh, in, in, in January, uh, Ambassador uh, Montezuma, uh, the, our two countries met and we dis uh, discussed objectives for the uh, U.S.-Mexico Bicentennial uh, Framework for Security, Public Health, and, and Safe Communities. Uh, unfortunately, um, in, in Mexico, we've seen a number of, of journalists uh, uh, killed um, just this, this year, uh, our eighth journalist uh, who lost uh, his life uh, reporting on press, the reporting on press freedom is part of press freedom. Uh, two days ago in the state of Michoacan, uh, uh, the, head, the head of Monitor Michoacan uh, was gunned down. Um, as I mentioned, the eight journalists thus far in, in Mexico this year, what, what new actions uh, is President Lopez Obrador looking at to 
protect journalists in Mexico? Well, um, that's a very, very um, uh, sad and uh, difficult issue. Uh, any killing, any any homicide in Mexico, and the, the the issue with the journalists is, of course, something that every Mexican uh, not only disapproves but also uh, wants to 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 do something about it and something fast. Uh, what uh, the president found when he arrived to office uh, two years ago was uh, increasing homicide uh, curve in Mexico. Uh, what he has done up to now is to stabilize that uh, curve, uh, which is uh, quite high. And um, there is a huge effort in security. As you mentioned, uh, we had the high-level security dialogue and uh, the Entendimiento Bicentenario uh, to work together in intelligence, to work together in uh, technology uh, to help uh, both countries to um, increase uh, security in, in, in Mexico and the United States. And um, if you analyze uh, different crimes in Mexico, uh, many of them, most of them, have been coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, and homicide has stabilized. So the effort has to be stronger. Uh, the, the effort ha has to be kept in order to prevent these uh, kind of uh, crimes. Uh, what is uh, something that, um, that I can tell you is that most of the uh, crimes of this uh, uh, journalist, uh, uh, the authority has uh, already solved uh, and kept the perpetrators in place, I have a list here. I knew that you were going to ask me something about it. Uh, Not that predictable. And <laughs> a, a very sad, you know, a, you know, Lourdes Maldonado was assassinated in Tijuana on January 23rd. Three people have been indicted. Aver Fernando Lopez in February, two people have been indicted. Jose Luis Gamboa in Veracruz. A, 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 the ongoing investigation. It's uh, determining the relationship between the murderer and his, uh, uh, in, in his profession. Margarito Martinez Esquivel was murdered in Tijuana, and there is a detention of five people in a joint operation. So uh, uh, justice is going uh, uh, to, to catch them, and uh, the issue here is not just to uh, put in jail perpetrators, but prevent these things from happening, which is the main effort for, of the government. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I raise the issue because it's something that I know collectively uh, uh, there's so much concern about press freedom in general in the, in the world these days. And so uh, protecting journalists is, of course, a, such a, a priority. Good to see those steps being taken. And also that the president's looking at additional steps to further protect journalists. Um, there is a specific program to, to a, a prevent this kind of crimes, and um, the budget for this program has been increased. Am Ambassador Salazar, uh, you made a statement on Monday as well, raising concerns about recent violent incidents in, in Mexico. Uh, earlier this week, the U.S. consulate in Nuevo Laredo was hit by uh, gunfire, causing the embassy to close, I believe, for a few hours, the consulate, the consulate to close for a few hours uh, earlier this week uh, as part of some retaliation following the arrest of Juan Trevino, El, El Luevo. Um, what, what do you see as needed to succeed in the bicentennial security framework? And what else is on the table, going back to the theme of cooperation, in which the US and Mexico can further cooperate to reduce these violent incidents? Jason, uh, thank you for the question. The reality of it is that our, our hearts are broken whenever you have a killing and killings of journalists when you have uh, people who live in fear, uh, and that happens both in Mexico, also here in the United States. I met with journalists just a couple mornings ago to talk about the reality in life and how they're dealing with it, but they live in fear. That, that shouldn't happen. Uh, but it also is something that has occurred, as Stephen was saying, because of the long history 
frankly, of corruption in Mexico that gives rise to a lot of the violence that we see now that shows what happens in places that I have visited, Michoacan, and threats that were made against workers there, the threats and assault that happened in the consulate in Nuevo León. So we take these issues very seriously. But I have to remind everybody that these things have been around for a very long yeah. time. And you don't go from the place where we have been to the place where we want to go, having societies that can live free of fear in a, a week, a day, right. a year, right. two. It's a long-term process. And I got to say this. We are working very well with uh, President Lopez Obrador and his cabinet writ large on all the security issues, on human smuggling, on firearms trafficking. In fact, the incident in, uh, in Nuevo Laredo happened because this very bad guy called El Huevo, he'd been pursued, he's an American citizen, yeah. dual, dual, dual citizenship, been pursued since the days of President George Bush. Okay? He's been taken down. Who took him down? Well, it was the Mexican government. It's their sovereignty. But they're doing that a lot. Yeah. And they're doing it with our support. Okay? Because we are going after the issue of violence and security under the framework of the Bicentennial Security Agreement. And I have to say, I have met with the President and uh, the Security Cabinet multiple times. And I have no doubt they're committed to doing everything they can, including rooting out corruptions. Mm -hmm. Corruption uh, across all the border and the land ports the land ports or the, the marine ports that are importing um, uh, fentanyl, we have a program like one has never seen where the two countries are working together on what is the most fundamental principle that underlies the Bicentennial Security Agreement, and that is that we're doing this together. It's not just a Mexican problem. It's not just a U.S. problem, illustrated by those powerful guns that I see everywhere yeah. that are coming in from the United States. So the concept of a shared problem and a shared responsibility is what we're implementing every day. I think that shared cooperation was seen on, on pictures when uh, El Huevo, when Juan Trevino was handed over to U.S. authorities uh, at, the, at the Friendship Bridge, uh, uh, I believe that was just yes, yesterday the, or, the, or the day before. Uh, what do you see, Ambassador Elzer's um, additional steps, as you, as you correctly point out, we're not going to get there from yet. From, you've, been, you've been ambassador for six months. Uh, we're not going to get there from one day to the next, but what are some next steps, concrete next steps that you see as possible to even further en enhance that security cooperation? So the security cooperation is happening now at a level that I don't think has ever happened between the United States and Mexico, and that's thanks to President Biden, to Attorney General Garland, to uh, Secretary Mayorkas and others who are part of this team. And then on the Mexican side, it's the whole security cabinet. We've never had this happen before in the 200 years of history yeah. between the United yeah. States and Mexico. That said, Jason, we need to deal with some of the root causes. Why is it that young people will take up a gun and kill other people without even thinking about it for a little bit of money? Mm -hmm. What's happening here is those are all manifestations of corruption. And that is, as Stevan said, something that uh, President Lopa Lopez Obrador has been focused on. We've got to root out the corruption. We have to give people hope, just like we do in the migrant corridors. We have to give people hope so that they don't go down the pathway of uh, delinquencia, yeah. which is essentially the prevention strategy that we believe here in the United States. Uh, we, we have just a few more minutes, and, and uh, I want to end with a, a slightly lighter, lighter topic. Uh, ambassador Monteverde, as I mentioned, you've been uh, here as ambassador for about a year now. Uh, this year, in December, we'll be celebrating the 200-year uh, bicentennial of U.S.-Mexico relations. Uh, I'll have a similar question to you as well, Ambassador Salazar. But Ambassador Monteverde, what's been the best part of your experience thus far in the in the in the United States, especially insofar as as you and I have talked about the deep cultural ties uh, that bond the U.S. And, and Mexico together? Well, I think that uh, the best experience has been the openness of the American society, the government, the, the Congress, to deal with um, uh, Mexican priorities, Mexican issues, Mexican problems, and that uh, what we have been building is working, which is uh, a very important dialogue. And the importance of this dialogue is that it's uh, uh, sectorized, uh, so you, we don't have 
uh, just a, a one specific group of people uh, trying to, to solve everything in a relationship, but we have very different people, offices, uh, agencies, and governmental uh, responsibles to deal with very different issues. So when something is not going well, it doesn't contaminate the next uh, issue. And so w if you go to my office one day, you will see that we're dealing with uh, uh, hundreds of issues. But all of them, uh, although they're connected, uh, have been treated separately in order uh, to prevent this contamination. So if uh, we don't have an agreement in one of the topics, that uh, wouldn't hinder us the advance in another one. Yeah. So what my best experience here has been that there is a will in America and there is a will in Mexico to understand each other. You know, we, 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 I always look at the U.S.-Mexico relationship not as a foreign policy relationship, but as a relationship among neighbors. And I think that your, your point goes exactly to that. A Ambassador Salazar, you mentioned you've had a chance to uh, travel around quite many different parts of, of Mexico as part of your uh, first six months uh, as ambassador. You obviously have deep uh, uh, cultural ties and uh, affinity to, to Mexico and your family history. What's been the most uh, enlightening part thus far of your, your time as ambassador? I would say the, the discovery really of the greatness of the two countries, uh, of the people and those who support us, the, the greatness of the United States of America, the leadership of President Biden, uh, which is focused and with a great cabinet that has supported us on all these initiatives in the last six months, it's been really incredible. Uh, the support on the United States side of what I call La Grandeza de Mexico, and part of the 3,000 or so employees that we have, working at places like Nuevo Laredo. Uh, I'm very, very proud of them. They make me proud every day. And then the, the greatness of the Mexican people and uh, the great country. We have over a million and a half United States citizens who live in uh, Mexico today. They're there because it's a beautiful country, whether you're in, in, uh, in places like Cancun that everybody knows, or whether you're in Puebla, or we're spread throughout, the, throughout Mexico. So that greatness is what gives me you know, six months into the job, even though some days it gets a little hard and tiring of the time zone. Some time zone changes don't often help, but uh, I'm more optimistic today uh, about the future of the U.S.-Mexico relationship than I ever have been. But good, it's only a few hours difference in the, in the time zone. Uh, I want to thank both you, Ambassador Salazar, for uh, coming here to the Atlanta Council as part of your trip to Washington. Ambassador Montezuma, thank you so much for, for uh, being here again. Thank you. And one great discovery was getting to know Ken Salazar. <laughs> well, let me say, one great discovery is Esteban Montezuma. I mean, these are hard questions, right? They, they shake the two countries, and they shake lots of people who are watching us right now. But I think this is emblematic of the kind of relationship that we're working on. And, yeah. You know, I think Mexico is tremendously, tremendously blessed uh, to have Esteban Montezuma here in Washington, D.C. There's not a week that passes when I don't talk to him, sometimes every day, uh, Sunday morning. So thank you, Esteban. Thank you, Kenny. And I, I think we are blessed as a country, as a country to have both of you uh, representing the, you represent the, the Mexico here in Washington, and Ambassador Salazar, you representing the U.S. and, and, and Mexico, and seeing those, those ties, those deep bonds between both of you and, and the countries, because uh, frankly, we're only going to achieve all overcoming some of these different challenges and building some of these opportunities with collaboration and, and with partnership. Uh, I want to again thank you for uh, for being here. A uh, uh, quick plug: we'll be having a um, Atlantic Council Agent Arts Latin America Center event as part of the Road to the Summit of the Americas later today at uh, noon in partnership with the State Department on green and equitable economic growth. Uh, I want to again thank uh, Congressman uh, Gonzalez for joining us in the in-studio audience and, and also Congressman uh, Lou Correa from California for joining us as well in studio. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for opening today's conversation and uh, look forward to the, the next time and I'll be sure to wear my green on the next time we have a conversation on St. Patty's Day, Ambassador Montezuma. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jason. Thank you.